Hi, and welcome to this uh, 4D Summit 2020 Digital Experience Edition. Uh, in this session, we're going to talk about uh, 4D and Let's Encrypt certificates. Um, so if you don't know it, Let's Encrypt is a new certificate authority, which allows you to get free certificates and to install them in an automated way. So this is very interesting, and I hope you will enjoy this subject. Um, this session is aimed at people who are using 4D as a web server, either to serve uh, static or dynamic HTML pages, or as an API uh, server. You may already use certificates, and it is becoming today mandatory to use certificates to protect your uh, HTTP communication. So my name is Bruno Legay, and I've been working with NC Consulting uh, for about 20 years. Uh, we are doing standard 4D uh, development on bespoke applications and we are also doing website uh, development using 4D and other related technologies. I will start with a bit of history because it's something I enjoy to put things in context. We will talk about the TLS and SSL certificates. I will explain uh, how the certificate works and TLS, how it's working, the TLS handshake. Uh, we will talk about the different types of certificates you can get, and we will see the problems we have with certificates and certificate authorities. I will then introduce Let's Encrypt, which is um, an attempt to solve all this problem. Um, and I will demo a component uh, which has been written in 4DV18. The source code is available and is on my GitHub, and you will get all the details at the end. Um, and uh, this component will help you to manage Let's Encrypt certificate, install them, and um, and use Let's Encrypt and make uh, good good use of Let's Encrypt. We will finish with um, a few tips to check the security of your website configuration. So let's get started. I've got uh, 70 slides, so um, let's go into it. So I'll start um, about um, the ancient history. Confidentiality has always been um, um, a problem. As soon as we started to uh, write, we started also to want to protect what we were writing to protect our communication. And uh, Julius Caesar um, was using a famous cipher called the Caesar cipher. Uh, the legend says that he invented it. And it's quite a simple cipher which um, consists of shifting the alphabet. So for instance, the A will become a C and the B will become a D and so on. So you just had a shift in your alphabet and you could encrypt a message that way. In the 16th century, Blaise de Vigenaire introduced a new cipher called uh, Vigenaire cipher, which is an extension to the Julius Caesar cipher, uh, combining a table and a passphrase. So this was an improvement of um, uh, Julius Caesar cipher. Now we're going to 1923, where uh, the Enigma machine was invented. It was invented in uh, Germany, and it was used by the German army for all of its communication. Um, it was a very efficient machine, very powerful, and uh, it's been in use until the end of the Second World War in 1945. In the 70s, it was revealed that from 1941, the Allies were able to break the Enigma messages during the war. All the details became more and more well known and the name and the role of Alan Turing was revealed. There was even a film about it called, I think, The Imitation Game. It's a fascinating story and I could do a whole presentation just on this subject, but today I'm going mostly to concentrate on Let's Encrypt. So I'm going to uh, go into modern history here it's in terms of uh, encryption and modern history, I think, starts when the transistors and the computer were created. And as soon as the computers were created, uh, we needed much better encryption so it couldn't be broken. So in 1976, two cryptographers, uh, Diffie and Elman, proposed a new solution which was based on using a private or secret key and a public key. Um, this is all based on mathematics principles, whereby uh, it is very difficult to factorize uh, large prime numbers. So that's in 1976. In 1977, uh, three other cryptographers, Rivest, 
Shamir and Adleman proposed an evolution of this system of uh, private key public key where this the system could be used to cipher the message and also to sign the message. Uh, they created the algorithm which um, carries their initials, RSA, and they also created a company which um, has been very successful. Then we end up in 1985 with uh, El Gamal. Uh, we wrote a paper on public key cryptography. Uh, this cryptographer is considered today as the father of the SSL protocol. Uh, he was working at uh, Netscape in 1994 when uh, Netscape released the first uh, web browser to allow uh, secured communication, so the introduction of HTTPS. Uh, since then, the SSL, and now TLS, has become the uh, standard uh, algorithm to secure HTTP communication and basically all the Internet. So a bit of uh, history on SSL and TLS. So SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, and it changed its name in the course of the evolution of uh, different versions. It's now called TLS, which stands for Transport Layer Security. So as I said, it started in 1994 as SSL01, and today we have TLS 1.2. So please note that TLS 1.0 and 1.1 will be deprecated in 2020. So you really need to use TLS 1.2 or TLS 1.3. So why do we use um, SSL and TLS? Why are the reasons? There are three reasons to use uh, HTTPS. Um, the first one is privacy. So we want to make sure that nobody can see the data that is exchanged between a client and a server. That could be, for instance, uh, a password or confidential information. We want integrity so that the data that, has, uh, that is transferred between the server and the client has not been modified by a third party. And the last one, which is also important, is trust. Uh, the site we are connecting to is really the one we are thinking we're connecting to. So if you connect to your bank, for instance, the fact that uh, you're connecting to Bank of America is important. You don't want to connect to a rogue uh, server. So now we can have a look at how it works. So before we look at how it works, SSL TLS, we need to understand the two different types of uh, encryption. The first type is the symmetric encryption. In this type of encryption, both parties here, um, Bob and Alice, they share a single key, which is the secret key, and it is the same key. And this key is used to uh, crypt and decrypt the message. So in this example, Alice wants to send a message to Bob and Bob will have exchange with Alice. We don't know how, but they will have exchange a secret key. Alice will use this secret key to encrypt the message, the clear uh, plain text message, and we will obtain a ciphertext message. The ciphertext message can then be securely transferred over the internet because nobody can read the message unless they have the secret key. And on reception, Bob will get this ciphertext encrypted message and he will use his secret key to decrypt the message. And he will then be able to read the original message that Alice wanted to send to Bob. These algorithms are usually very fast. Uh, for instance, the standard today is AES256. And this algorithm is um, optimized in modern uh, processes. So it's done um, at processor level today. So it's very, very fast indeed. Um, the problem with this algorithm that it is difficult to exchange the key in a uh, secure manner. So um, the advantage is that it's fast. The problem is that it's difficult to exchange the keys. So the other type of uh, encryption we have is the asymmetric uh, encryption where you will have um, two keys. Um, so the receiver here, Bob, because Alice still wants to send a secret message to Bob. So Bob uh, creates or has a secret key. And from this secret key, he will generate uh, a public key. With this public key, it will transmit to people who wants to send him a message or even share it to the public. He could, for instance, put it on its website. 
So then Alice will use Bob's uh, public key to encrypt uh, a message. Once the message is encrypted, it can be securely transferred over the internet. And when Bob receives the message, he will use its secret key to decrypt the cipher message, the ciphered encrypted message, to obtain the original message. So only the receiver with the secret key can decrypt the message. Uh, the problem with this um, type of encryption is that it is very slow compared to the symmetric encryption. So now that we understand how both uh, encryption algorithm works, we can have a look at the uh, TLS handshake protocol. So the TLS handshake protocol is an exchange of few TCP packets between a client and the server. So the client will connect to the server, sending a client hello message. The server will respond with a server hello message. So the server, I forgot to say, it's got two things. It's got a private key and it's got a certificate. And inside the certificate, there is the public key associated with the private key that the server is using. So now when the server sends the server hello message, he sends the certificate and a public key. So what the client is going to do now is going to generate a unique session key, which is a large random number, and it's going to use the public key, which was sent by the server, to encrypt this key. And the client will then send this key, encrypted, to the server. So this is the client key exchange message. And it will send also information about a different cipher algorithm it supports. And the server on reception of this message will use its private secret key to read the uh, unique session key which was generated by the client and which was encrypted using the public key from the server. So the server will have the unique session key, the same key that the client has on its side. It will also look at the different cipher it supports and it will choose the best cipher supported by both parties. And it will reply to the client saying, uh, we can use this cipher now and we can start our secure communication because we can start now, we can switch to symmetric encryption. So this is the TLS handshake. And from then on, you can start a secure communication here. For instance, a client will send an HTTP GET to the server. And this is done under HTTPS, under TLS connection. And this is totally secure. So this is the TLS handshake. So what are the general requirements to have a server with HTTPS? First of all, you need to have a web server reachable from the internet with a static uh, public IP address. Second thing, you need to have a registered domain name. You usually do this uh, with a DNS registrar, and then you need to configure your DNS to point to your uh, public IP address. You also need the port 80, which is used for HTTP, and 443, which is used for HTTPS, opened. So this is done usually on your firewall or your router. And you need also to have probably an add configuration to route the traffic towards or to your machine, to your server. And finally, you will also need a certificate to do HTTPS. So now we can talk about um, uh, certificates. Um, so here we, I'm going to explain the process of getting a certificate. So what an admin usually will do to get a certificate, the first thing it will do is going to is going to create a private key and a public key. And it's going to keep the private key in a very secure manner. He's not going to let the private key out of his um, environment. Then the next step is going to create a standard document, a standard file, a file format called a certificate signing request. And to do that is going to provide um, the public key. So usually you, prob you use the private key, but from the private key, you calculate the public key because really in the certificate signing request, what's inside the certificate signing request is the public key from the uh, web server. So it's not the private key which is transmitted. The private key always stays uh, with the web server or with the admin. It doesn't go out 
of your organization. It should never go out. So the other information you put in the CSR are subject identifier, like a common name. So that's the FQDN, fully qualified domain name, which is the um, subdomain plus the uh, domain. It could be information about your organization, your city, your state, and whatever, your address, and so on. So you generate uh, a certificate signing request, which is a file, which you send then to uh, um, certificate authorities. So the certificate authority will then make some administrative or technical checks and then will generate a certificate which you will collect and then install on your server. And from then on, you will be able to uh, use HTTPS and secure your communication. So now we're going to talk about certificate authorities. Um, certificate authorities are commercial companies in the business of delivering certificates to their clients. Um, certificate authorities root certificates are pre-installed in the keychain on Mac OS X and they are pre-installed in the browsers on Windows. There are about 100 certificate uh, authorities with pre-installed root certificates. And then a main certificate with a root certificate can cross sign a second level certificate authority. So in reality, there are thousands of certificate authorities. So here I've put a few names of uh, famous certificate authorities like DigiCert, VeriSign, Komodo, and so on. Um, so now we're going to talk about the certificate types. The cheapest certificate uh, you can get is a self-signed certificate. Basically, you are then uh, becoming your own certificate authority. So technically, this works for encrypting uh, your communication over HTTPS. But the problem is the trust uh, for these certificates, because you can see easily with this kind of certificate, you can pretend to be Bank of America, and this is not going to be uh, a good idea. So of course, when using self-signed certificates, the browser are going to put a big message saying, this is not a safe site, and don't use that site. So this is why self-signed certificates are good for test, but they're not good for production. For the certificate delivered by the certificate authorities, we can see three levels of certificates. The first one is the DV uh, certificate, which is domain validation. This is the basic certificate without administrative validation. Then you get the OV certificate, which is the organization validation some administrative checks are performed by the authority. And now the Rolls-Royce of certificate is the EV certificates, which stands for extended validation. So with this kind of certificate, some advanced administrative checks are performed by the authority. Uh, EV certificate will make your browser display the name of your organization in the uh, URL bar and you will have also the URL displayed in green with the padlock. Um, but this behavior may disappear in the near future uh, in um, browser releases. So now we're going to talk about um, different types of certificates. Um, the basic certificate you will get usually will just uh, contain the domain name, the FQDN, here we've got, for instance, www.example.com. Um, but if you want to use many subdomains, what people want generally to use is the wildcard certificate. Uh, wildcard certificate will start with star.example.com. And these certificates are sold for much more money than the basic domain uh, name certificate, uh, because, of course, the star is more expensive than www. So um, this is uh, the wildcard certificates. And then you get a new option, which I think is very interesting, which is called the SAN certificate. SAN stands for Subject Alternative Names. So if you know in advance all the subdomains you're going to use, you can just give the name of the list of all these FQDN, so these fully qualified domain names. So here in this example, I've given www.example.com but the www.example.fr. And you could see already this is very interesting because you could combine several uh, domain names with the same certificate. 
So this is a very good alternative. So now we're going to have a look at a few certificates uh, from the wild. So here I've got, I'll try to um, make this a bit bigger so we can have a look. Here we have a certificate uh, issued by Let's Encrypt and it was issued to uh, 4D and it contains the main name which is events.4d.com and we can see there is actually uh, SAN, so subject alternative names which are events.4d.com and summit.4d.com. Uh, this is a basic certificate. We can see in the subject there is only one information, which is the name. So this is the basic certificate from Let's Encrypt, typical Let's Encrypt certificate with SAN. Now we're going to have a look at um, another certificate. This is a wildcard certificate. It was issued by RapidSSL and we can see it's a basic certificate also because there is only one information in the subject. So it's a DV certificate. Um, so here then on the other side, we can see also a, a wildcard certificate issued to Trello.com. And this was issued by DigiCert. And we can see it's an OV certificate. We can see that in the subject section, we can see information about the organization. So this is an OV certificate. So in the next page, we're going to see a EV certificate, as I told you, the Rolls Royce of the certificates. And we can see here it's a EV certificate delivered by DigiCert uh, Extended Validation Certificate Authority. We can see that there are much more information in the subject section. We can see the name of the company, which is uh, Apple Inc. in the URL. It's displayed in green. And we can also see that this is uh, combined with subject alternative names, where we can see, for instance, Apple is using this as well with www.apple.com.cn. So we can um, imagine that this certificate is also used in China with, um, with this uh, FQDN. So let's go back. Okay. So here I've put a little glossary if you are interested in, um, in terms used in the, when you're managing certificates. So there are several formats, several information and uh, acronyms and so on. So you may find these useful. Uh, let's have a look. So now, how do we generate uh, RSA key pair with uh, 4D? So the command generate encryption key pair has been with 4D for many years now. Um, it allows to generate simultaneously two keys, the private key and the public key, using the RSA algorithm. Um, you provide the key size. I recommend today using 2048 bits. After using generate encryption key pair, you will get uh, two keys in a blob or text or whatever. They are um, text base, so it's base 64 encoded with a begin and end tag. With 4D, you can generate a certificate signing request, a CSR. Uh, you will have to use two arrays, which are synchronized, uh, to specify the information for the subject. The most important one is the uh, common name, which will contain your FQDN, but you could also um, specify some information about your organization and so on, and your city, your country. You will provide your private key and you will obtain a CSR. The CSR, again, is a text file or text based. It's base64 encoded with a begin and end tag. And this is this CSR you are going to send to your certificate authority. Unfortunately, this command doesn't support subject alternative names. Now we're going to have a look at OpenSSL, uh, the same function done with OpenSSL. So to generate a, an RSA key pair, you will uh, first use gen RSA to obtain a private key. Here I've put uh, 2048 bits. And then from this private key, you can generate the public key with a second command, OpenSSL RSA. To generate a certificate signing request, you can use this command, which is openssl rec, 
and you put these parameters and you could um, put the key which is the private key which you will use to generate your CSR you will specify the information for your subject and you will obtain a file which is the uh, CSR file you can check the content of a CSR file or certificate signing request using this command which is OpenSSL rec and you will see the information contained in your CSR you will see here the subject and you will also see that the CSR contains your public key which was generated from your private key if you want to create a self-signed certificate um, you can use this command so this command will actually create a private key a self-signed certificate um, in one go and it will create them with the proper names for the for 4D so the key will be key.pem and the certificate will be cert.pem um, it will create a certificate which will be valid for 10 years I've put here 3650 days and it's you will create also uh, an RSA key of 2048 bits so in one command you can create the private key and the self-signed certificate so if you need a self-signed certificate this command is for you so what problems do we have now um, with uh, all this process um, the process of getting certificate installing them is far too complicated it's not standardized it's um, all human based it's error prone and it's you've got to remember we need to renew your certificate you've got to do all these manual operations send the file wait for the response if it is also difficult to compare the offers from the different CAs uh, they're not making it easy for you to compare the offers they will have lots of names for the different products and a lot of warranties so it's not an easy thing to shop and look for a good um, uh, certificate authority another problem is that there are far too many certificate authorities and this can be an issue when some of them have been compromised or gone rogue um, and also the final part is that there is a cost and the cost may be sometimes minimal but it's always a problem when you are in a company and you need to get a, a credit card to purchase a certificate or when you're selling a solution to your client you need to um, uh, invoice them for this certificate for um, maybe 10 20 euros plus the time you spend on it so it's 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 painful it's um it's not an easy and fun job to do so the solution to all these problems was actually to create a new certificate authority which is let's encrypt so let's encrypt was created at the end of 2014 by people from the EFF uh, from Mozilla and the University of Michigan the financial sponsorship was with uh, Cisco and Akamai um, Eden Trust did cross sign let's encrypt uh, CA uh, certificates to start with and the project is hosted in its own non-profit organization which is ISRG the key principles are it's free it's automatic I'm going to go th quickly through the key principle but you can look on the website to see more in details about what they really mean by all these it's secure it's transparent it's open and it's cooperative um, Today's sponsors are Mozilla, Cisco, EFF, OVH, which is a large uh, French hosting company, Chrome, Facebook, and so on. So now we can have a look at some stats. Here are some stats about the number of active uh, certificates. So we went from 2016, when the project started to go in production, to now. So we went from zero certificate to around 200 million certificate in four years this is huge now we're going to have a look also at an interesting stat uh, this is the evolution of usage of HTTPS the information was obtained by uh, Firefox as a Firefox telemetry um, information so in 2014 uh, about 30 percent of pages loaded by Firefox were done uh, through HTTPS 
and in 2020 we are now at about 80% of pages loaded uh, with HTTPS. There are many reasons which explain why this has evolved, one of which is that uh, Google has also put pressure on websites to uh, use HTTPS. So now if you are in the 20% of people or websites which are not using HTTPS, then I recommend you uh, get into uh, HTTPS quickly. Or if you are in the 80% of uh, people which are using HTTPS, I will also uh, suggest you consider Let's Encrypt to benefit from um, their offer of free certificates. So another stat, uh, this is the number of certificate issued per day since 2016. And today in 2020, Let's Encrypt issues more than a million certificate a day. This is absolutely huge. And finally, recently, uh, Let's Encrypt announced on the 27th of February, they've announced that they have uh, generated or issued 1 billion certificate. Uh, today, Let's Encrypt is by far the largest certificate authority. It's gone beyond all the other certificate authorities. So when we talk sometimes about disruptive, Let's Encrypt has been a very disruptive organization within the uh, certificate authorities business. So very interesting indeed. So about the standard tools, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, um, the tool which Let's Encrypt provide. Uh, the first one is Certbot, uh, which you can get from here. Um, it's a tool which you can use, for instance, with Apache to install and renew your certificates. And there are a list of other clients for different environments to use Let's Encrypt. So for instance, if you want to use Let's Encrypt with WordPress, or if you, for instance, have a website hosted on OVH, uh, for instance, on OVH, you just have to click uh, one button and you have um, a new certificate. So it's that simple to obtain certificates because it's integrated in many environments and languages. So now I'm going to try to describe uh, how um, Let's Encrypt works. So we're going to talk about ACME, which is Automatic Certificate Management Environment. This is the acronym. Um, so ACME works with HTTPS and JSON. Uh, the documentation is available on this RFC 8555. Um, and Let's Encrypt uh, does not have the human resources to make the administrative checks uh, that the other certificate authorities do. So the verifications are all automated. And the idea is that if you have a domain name, if you have the control of your DNS, and if you have a website, you are legitimate to obtain a certificate. And therefore, these validations are performed through what uh, um, Let's Encrypt call challenges. And we're going to explain the different uh, challenges there are in a few slides. Now I'm going to talk about the versions because there are two versions of uh, Acme. Acme V1 was released in April 2016 and it is now deprecated and it will stop working in June 2020, which is very soon. So if you use Acme V1, you should really start to look for a solution for Acme V2. So Acme V2 was released in March 2018 and it's uh, active today still, and there are still some slight evolution in the protocol, but it is the one you should use today. So now I'm going to talk about the different challenge types. Um, there are four challenge types. The first one is the one which will interest us the most, which is HTTP01 challenge. And we will talk a bit more uh, in detail about it in the next slide. So HTTP01. The next challenge type is DNS01. With DNS01, you will need to add an entry in your DNS to prove to, uh, you have control over it, but you need to do that in a dynamic manner. So the problem with this technique, you need first to have a DNS that you can control through an API, and you need to store the credentials somewhere 
to control and access this API. So usually this will be on your website to implement the uh, DNS challenge. The problem uh, with this challenge is that if your web server gets compromised, a hacker will probably access your credentials for your DNS. And from then on, you will have total control on your DNS. And this, from then on, this is what we call game over. So this is a very risky business. And this is why I didn't want to go too much into DNS01 and I didn't implement it. The third challenge is called TLS SNI01. Um, SNI stands for Server Name Indication. It is an extension to the TLS uh, protocol, which allows to transmit the, um, the host name uh, during the TLS negotiation and shake. And there was a security issue with this challenge. challenge. So it has been identified and the challenge has been um, uh, deprecated and it's not used today. The fourth and last challenge is TLS ALPN01. Uh, ALPN means uh, TLS with application level protocol negotiation. It is an extension to the TLS protocol, which consists of specifying the uh, host domain during uh, TLS handshake. It is a RFC, RFC 7301 from July 2014. It is implemented in OpenSSL 102 since January 2015, um, but it's not activated uh, in the latest version of 4D, unfortunately. So this makes it quite difficult to implement this uh, challenge with 4D at the moment. So we're going to go in a bit more in detail about HTTP01. Um, we won't go in the full detail of the uh, protocol if you want to look how, how it works and I'll recommend you look at the RFC, but I will try to describe um, in a simplified manner how it works. So for this challenge, Let's Encrypt will give you a token and with a unique value, a large unique value, and then it will check that you have the control over the web server by trying to um, get a URL with uh, this token. So it will do an HTTP get on port 80, of course, so unencrypted uh, for this URL containing the token. It will retrieve a value and it will compare it to the value it is expecting uh, to retrieve. If it does find a match with the value it is expecting, it will consider that you have control over the DNS, the web server, and that you deserve a certificate. Then you just have to um, uh, fetch the certificate and install it. So this is how it works, the HTTP 01. So what do we get with uh, Let's Encrypt? Um, we get a DV certificate. As I said, uh, Let's Encrypt are about 12 people, so there is no way they can do anything else other than DV. They are, don't have time to call your organization to check who you are. So they are just going to give you DV certificate, the basic certificates. If you want an OV certificate or EV certificate, you still have to go through the standard uh, classic certificate authorities. So you can get the certificates with SANS, with subject alternative names. So you can have more than one FQDN in your certificates, which is great. You will get a certificate which will last for 90 days. I know this is a shock to many people, but when you think that you can totally automate the process, you can renew your certificates every 60 days, and that still leaves you a margin of 30 days to renew your certificates. So don't worry about the uh, duration of the certificate. It's, it's fine. Um, keep in mind also that certificates today are going to be shorter and shorter. For instance, Apple recently announced that they won't allow certificates which are going to be more than 398 days or something like that. So a certificate really today will last about a year, no more. Um, you can get wildcard certificates, but it's only possible with the DNS01 challenge. So I'm not going to go too much into that. A few things to watch out. Um, when you use Let's Encrypt, of course, uh, they have put in place some rate limits. 
So if you are in production environment, don't try to hammer the service with too many requests to get certificates. So if you are doing some test, uh, you have to use staging environment. So you have to use different uh, URLs and I will show you how to do that. But uh, for your setup or testing at the beginning, please use staging. Otherwise you will reach the rate limits and you will be blocked for a week. Um, this applies for uh, one given domain. So you can be blocked on one domain and still get certificates on another domain, but still it's uh, it's annoying to be blocked for a week. So be, be careful, uh, use the staging environment during um, testing. You also need to keep your port 80 open. I've uh, heard people uh, asking about this. Yes, you need to keep your port 80 open. This is a standard thing and uh, keep your port 80 open. Of course, you can install uh, Let's Encrypt uh, at uh, the reverse proxy level. Here I've put a few reverse proxy, which are interesting. Apache, and Jinx, Envoy, HA proxy. And the last one, which I really like, is Caddy. It's a, a new reverse proxy. It's written in Go, the Go language. Um, it creates a single binary. There is no dependency, so it's quite simple to install. It's available on Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux and uh, it's got Let's Encrypt built-in with TLS ALPN01 built-in and uh, you can also control it through a REST API to configure the uh, reverse proxy. So it's something you could do, for instance, with uh, 4D, you can send um, uh, a REST uh, HTTP request to the CADI server and you will have your CADI configured as you want. You can, of course, uh, install your reverse proxy on Docker or Kubernetes. Um, there was a component written by Tim Penner in October 2016. It's called Acme Client Component for 4D. Uh, it implements Acme V1, which is soon, unfortunately, going to be deprecated. Uh, you can get it from this uh, URL. And there was a 4D method user group uh, presentation about this component done in uh, 2017. I was curious about uh, Let's Encrypt and I really wanted to uh, find out about that protocol and I wanted to see if I could do it, if I could implement the version 2 of the protocol. So I started a new project um, uh, around uh, Let's Encrypt. So it's called uh, Acme Component and it was it's implementing Acme v2 protocol. Uh, it was written originally in 4D v15 in December 2018. So it's largely back portable to uh, 4D v15 if you need. Uh, the current version is uh, 100. It is written in 4D v18 in project mode and it is available on GitHub. Uh, it uses OpenSSL v1020 from the 27th of March 2018 and the binaries for both platforms, uh, Windows and OS X, are embedded within the component. It implements HTTP01 challenge only. The um, configuration files are stored in local data files. It supports SAN certificate and it's been used in production with uh, some of our clients for more than six months now. Uh, it generates a lot of logs, so if there is a problem, I can always look into it and see what went wrong. Now we're going to do a demonstration of uh, the ACME component and I'm going to launch for DV18. going to open my demo database. Okay, so in this demo database, I'm going to show you first the preferences which are specific to me. If you are using this uh, demo database, you will have to put your own values here, of course, and you will have to make sure that your um, DNS is configured to point to your machine and so on. So here I've put my email address, but you can put several email address. This is used to create a Let's Encrypt uh, account. 
I said here that I agree with the terms of service of Let's Encrypt. I've put here a little button to uh, look at the um, Let's Encrypt uh, terms of service, which is going to come hopefully. Yes. Here we go. So that's the uh, Let's Encrypt terms of service. If I'm sure that you're going to read all the small lines here. Okay. And here I've put uh, the two FQDN, which are the fully qualified domain names I'm going to use with my website. So, so here I've put the two FQDNs I'm going to use. Um, maybe you can make that bigger so you can see. Yeah, so I've put the two FQDNs. So, and now I'm going to have a look at the demo. Okay, so this is the demo screen. My server has not started yet. Um, I can see here that I've got no certificates and I'm working in production. So first thing I'm going to test, um, I'm going to start my web server and since I don't have certificates, it should start in HTTP only. So let's have a look at that. So I'm going to check uh, the, the way it works with uh, curl because it's much more efficient. So here I'm doing a curl on HTTP and I'm getting a response from my server, which is great. And I'm going to try to do the same thing with HTTPS. And because the server hasn't started as HTTPS server, I don't get any response. So this is totally normal. I'm going back to my application. So I will use here this button to prepare the CSR, send the CSR to Let's Encrypt and uh, wait for Let's Encrypt to start the HTTP01 challenge. I will get my server ready to respond to this challenge. And once I have uh, verified that Let's Encrypt has verified all the challenges and is happy enough to give me a certificate, I will then be able to uh, retrieve the certificate, install it and restart my web server. So this button is going to do all this. So I'm going to click on the certificate and then we're going to look at the logs generated uh, to get the certificates. So here we go. Look at the logs. So here in this area, a bit later, we're going to see information about the progress of Let's Encrypt. We will see some notification about uh, the major steps that are being achieved with Let's Encrypt. So it's all doing stuff here. So let's pray the demo gods and hope that everything goes well. So the order has been accepted. Now we're probably going to respond to the challenges. And we should have now the certificate that looks like a certificate here. And if we look here, we have obtained our certificate and our server has restarted in HTTPS. So we're going back here and we're going to check. So we're going to check HTTPS and we've got an answer now on HTTPS. So our certificate is working. We're going to have a look at HTTP and HTTP is now responding with a 301 response to tell we should move to HTTPS. So this is all working. So with this demo also, I've put a little uh, button here to read the content of the certificate. So it just uh, shows the certificate in a human readable way. I've put here a button to um, view the certificate. So the certificate is here. We can see it's the time where I've obtained the certificate. So that's a certificate and the key. Let's go back to here. We can delete the certificate. I'm not going to do that because, as I told you, um, there are some rate limits. And if I order too many certificates, um, Let's Encrypt will block me for a week. So I'm not going to do that. I can also here renew a certificate or order a new one. Here, this is the button to show the log file. And uh, this is basically my demo. Um, so I'm going back to um, the slides 
to show you the code um, which will show you how to use the component. So the first thing you need to do is to write uh, an init method for Let's Encrypt, which will do a few things. The first thing is that if you are going to use the staging environment, you should use the line with uh, acme uh, underscore directory URL set. So just uh, some information, all the uh, methods with a uh, acme prefix are from the Let's Encrypt uh, acme component. Uh, the methods which have got a prefix cert are methods that you should create yourself to uh, use acme component. So uh, let's carry on from after this um, information. So first one to decide if you're going to use staging or production. So if you're doing test, use staging. Second things you're going to specify with Acme working DS set, the directory you're going to use to store um, preferences about Acme component, uh, things like, for instance, information about your Let's Encrypt account. Then we're going to call a method called cert account init, and we're going to have a look uh, at this method later. Basically, this method will initialize your account or make sure you have an account with Let's Encrypt. Then we're going to write a method called cert renew auto, which will check that if you have a certificate, if you don't have a certificate, you will um, order one and install one. And if you have a certificate, you will make sure it's not going to expire soon. And if, you, if it does, then you will need to renew your certificate. So we're going to have a look also at this method. And once you've done these two things, you can uh, start your web server. So that's the first method you need to, to do. Now we're going to have a look at the cert account in it. In the cert account in it, the first method we're going to use is acme account object get. This is a method from the component which will return the information about your Let's Encrypt account in an object. Uh, we don't really care about what's in the object. We just want to know if the object is empty or null or if there are information in the object. Uh, the object actually looks like this. Um, it's very simple, um, but uh, we're not going to use any of the information. We just want to know if it's empty. If it's empty, it means you haven't got an account with Let's Encrypt and you need to create one. So if we need to create an object, we're going to call cert account create, which we're going to look at now. So with cert account create, we're going to give uh, two information to a function called Acme new account object. We're going to give uh, a contact, an email. So it could be just one email or it could be an array containing several emails. And we're going to give a Boolean set to true to say that we agree with the terms of service. So with this method, we're going to obtain a, an object uh, which is just uh, created by this method. This is very simple. Um, this is um, a kind of constructor for this object. And with this object, we're going to give it to Acme new account. And Acme new account will actually use this information from this object to create your account with Let's Encrypt and then save this information returned by Let's Encrypt, including an account ID in your local preference um, files. So now we're going to look at the cert renew auto um, method, which we need to create. So with, in this method, we're going to use acme cert current get, which will load the current certificate. Um, it will load it in a PEM format in a text. If this method returns true, it means that you have a certificate. If it returns false, it means you've got no certificate and therefore you need to renew your certificate. So if you have a certificate, we're going to say we want to renew the certificate 30 days before it will expire. So to do that, we're going to use Acme cert check hand. We're going to pass the certificate, which is in PEM format, and the delay we want to use, which has been converted in seconds. So if we are, for instance, um, 35 days before the expiration, renew will be false. If we are 29 days before the expiry date, renew will be true. So if you have renew, then we will call at the end of the method cert renew, and we're going to have a look 
at this method now. So this is search renew in a simplified way, and it's using just one function called Acme Certificate Order and Install, and it will take an array of domains. So here you will find the list of domains you want to use um, for your certificate. So this will create a CSR with SAN subject alternative names for all these domains. It will send the uh, CSR file to Let's Encrypt. It will prepare to respond to the challenge. It will respond to the challenge, then wait that Let's Encrypt has finished with all the challenge and it will then get the certificate, install the certificate and restart your web server. This is all done with just one method. Um, and then if it works, it returns OK and you are done, basically. There are two more things you need to do. The first one is you need to add one line in your on-web authentication method. You need to add the line where you're going to use Acme on-web authentication um, to trap and catch when the uh, Let's Encrypt challenge is called. And in this case, you're going to set VB allow to true and then you don't run your own code. I uh, have put here also a line to redirect unsecure request, uh, but uh, this is something also you may have to do. So this is for the on-web authentication, and you also need to do the same thing on on-web connection, where you will add a line to do uh, Acme on-web connection, uh, passing the URL, and this will trap the uh, HTTP 01 challenge and respond and send the proper information that Let's Encrypt is expecting to verify the challenge. So, so now we can have a look at a few tips. Um, the first one is about ciphers. Uh, as you know, 4D is um, provided with a, a list of ciphers, and you can change this list of ciphers using the set database parameter with the SSL cipher list parameter. Um, there is two recommendations I would say about this. The first one is that when you change this cipher list, it applies to your web server, but it also applies to your client server secured communication. So if you use client server uh, secured communication, please be uh, careful when you change this list because you can break one without uh, realizing. Um, second thing I would recommend also is that you need to make, uh, uh, not like I showed here, you need to make this list modifiable without needing to recompile your application. You don't really want to recompile and reinstall an application just because you want to remove one of these algorithms. So my advice is to make this uh, as a parameter. A few information now about 4D v16R6. So in v16R6, in terms of web serving, uh, two things happened. RC4 which is an encryption algorithm, uh, has been disabled by default. And the second one was the introduction of PFS, which stands for Perfect Forward Secrecy. It offers a better protection of the ephemeral session key uh, if your secret key has been compromised. And you will then notice a new file appearing called dhparams.pem. It is used on the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, which is um, which acronym is DH or ECDH, which is the elliptic curve version. So this is for uh, 16R6. Another new feature in 4D v17, there was the introduction of HSTS. HSTS is an option which stands for HTTP Strict Transport Security. Uh, it is a system where the browser will remember that your website needs to be contacted in HTTPS and not HTTP. Usually, sometimes you will get people connecting to HTTP, then you will get a redirect to HTTPS. With this um, option, the browser will have a database of websites which it will always contact as HTTPS without first trying HTTP. So this is done uh, with these commands, with web set uh, option. And actually, when you will see this information in the um, HTTP response header from your uh, 4D web server once you've activated 
this option, you will see the strict transport security header with a value which is the number of seconds for which you want to keep um, this information in the browser um, memory. So usually this is a very long period of time. Usually you will put a period like one, two or three years in seconds. So for three years, this web browser will uh, contact you directly over HTTPS. The next new command, which has been introduced in 4DV16R6, is very interesting. It's called web get server info, and it returns an object which lot of information about your web server, like uh, the open SSL version, the Cypher suite, um, the TLS version, and so on. You could get information about the cache, about the options. So it is a very useful command. Another tip is the uh, DNS CIA. Uh, this is a configuration you can do on your DNS uh, to specify which uh, certificate authorities are allowed to deliver certificates for your domain. So in this example, we have configured in our ANC consulting.fr, we have configured two CA which are allowed to generate certificates. So this CA are Amazon and Let's Encrypt. And we can check this information using the command dig. So mixed content security errors. Um, when you switch from HTTP to HTTPS, all the resources from uh, your page should be in HTTPS. So if you have uh, resources with a URL HTTP, you will get a mixed content security error. To help you with these errors, there is three options. The first one is to add an HTTP header called content security policy with the value upgrade insecure uh, requests. The second is to fix uh, the URL in your HTML source. Uh, you could replace, of course, the HTTP with HTTPS, or you could completely remove the protocol and then the browser will use the current protocol to load the resource. And you could also use uh, an extension called HTTPS Everywhere, which will help you to identify within your web page what resources are not in HTTPS. So this is, these are the three options you can have. Uh, now I'm going to give you information about how to check the, um, the security of your, not your server, because it goes beyond the your web server, but about your SSL and TLS configuration. Uh, to do that, I'm going to give you here three tools. The first one is OpenSSL S client, which will initiate a TLS SSL connection to a server. The second one is Nmap, and the third one is SSL Labs. So you've got the commands uh, in the slides, so you can have a look, but we're going to have a quick demo to see how that works. So here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to press on this button to start a test by Qualys SSL Labs. And because this takes a bit of time, uh, during while it's doing that, we're going to do the other uh, options. So the first one we're going to do is to use the OpenSSL S client to connect to our web server. Okay, and this is usually very fast. And we've got here a connection. Here we can see it has connected. We can see the Let's Encrypt certificate. Um, we can see the certificate chain. Here is the certificate. We can see here um, we are in TLS v1.2. We can see which cipher has been used. And uh, so this is all good with um, OpenSSL. So this is a good way to check how your certificate is installed. The other command I told you about is uh, Nmap. Nmap is used uh, a lot by people which have got an interest in security. And we're going to launch this command to check the configuration of our TLS. Uh, this usually takes a bit more time than uh, OpenSSL, but it has um, finished now. So we can see here we have made a connection on port 443 on HTTPS. We can see information here about our certificate. Uh, we can see information about here the key which has been used. We can see the information about the validity of our certificate. 
and we can see here the TLS version 1.2 and here the list of ciphers. Um, here Nmap gives us a global rate uh, for the configuration of A which is very good for a map. And now we're going to have a look at the results of SSL Labs. So I'm getting an A plus with my configuration, which is very good. And here I'm getting all the details about uh, my TLS configuration. Here I'm getting information about my certificates. Here I'm getting information by the versions of TLS I'm using. So it's only one point, TLS 1.2. Here I'm got, getting information by the cipher suites. And here I'm getting compatibility information with a browsers and OS versions. So you can see that old browser or OS are not supported, but sometimes you've got to do that in, a, in order to have a proper uh, good security. So it's always a compromise, but A plus is a very good score. So now we're going to go back to the presentation. And I've made few tests uh, with different versions of 4D. And we can see here that uh, version 4 or 4D version 12 and 13 should not be used really with uh, web serving today. And really today you should use version 17 or version 18 uh, for uh, web serving. The difference between A and A plus is mostly related to the usage of the HSTS option. If you don't have HSTS, which is the case by default, you will get an A score. If you activate HSTS, you will get an A plus score. So just to finish, so this is an open source component. Um, so if you see uh, bugs or if you see improvement in the code, please submit. Uh, I will try to uh, put them back into the main uh, version. Um, here I've put more links about Let's Encrypt. There are many presentations that I looked at or information about SSL and Let's Encrypt. So please have a look at those. They're very interesting um, if you want to find out more about Let's Encrypt. Uh, finally, I want to say that if you are using Let's Encrypt and you like it, uh, consider donating a few dollars to them uh, to encourage them to carry on their activities. I think they are a great organization, a great ID and a great project. So I think it will help them to carry on. Finally, thank you for your attention. You can see below our URL for our website. If you need uh, help with your projects on 4D, on security or website, please get in touch with us. We'll see what we can do for you. You can see my LinkedIn if you want to get in touch with me or at the bottom here you get the GitHub where you will be able to find the component. So I hope you have uh, enjoyed this presentation. Are you going to enjoy using Let's Encrypt with 4D?